Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Closing the Loop, the Circular Economy, Business and Sustainability. We appreciate you joining us today. I'm Anita Wood, and I manage the Stanford Energy, Innovation and Emerging Technologies Program, also known as the EIET Program, here at the Stanford Center for Professional Development. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, Julia Novi. In this webinar, Julia will describe steps businesses are taking to integrate circular economy approaches into core business strategies. And she will highlight key business models of the circular economy and discuss national and global trends. Julia is professor of the practice and executive director of the Stanford's Change Leadership for Sustainability program and she co-teaches the XEIT 110 Strategies for Sustainability course, which is in the EIET program. Her research and her teaching focus on business strategies, leadership approaches, and cross-sector partnerships that spur global development and align systems with the goal of intergenerational well-being. The Change Leadership Program explores the mindsets, knowledge, and tools leaders need to accelerate the transition to move more to a more sustainable and resilient society. These include understanding complex systems, leading organizational change, and innovating in complex systems at scale in order to shift suboptimal status quo orientations toward sustainability. With over 20 years of experience leading nonprofit and philanthropic philanthropic organizations, Julia recognized for her innovative leadership in designing, scaling entrepreneurial uh, solutions to global challenges that integrate economic, social, and environmental objectives. In 2013, she founded Resilience in Action, which is dedicated to helping 21st century leaders cultivate resilience in their lives, organizations, and sectors. As executive director of the Lemelson Foundation, Julia was responsible for guiding over 100 million of investment in new technology, inventors, and social enterprises in the US and developing countries. Julia also served as the director of World Wildlife Fund Pacific Marine Office, where she collaborated with colleagues at Unilever and the World Wildlife Fund to help develop and launch the Marine Stewardship Council. In 2010, Julia was recognized as a distinguished young global leader by the World Economic Forum and served as a topic leader for the Clinton Global Initiative on Market-Based Solutions to Environmental Challenges. Julia is a Fulbright and Marshall Scholar and speaks French, Spanish, Kiswahili, and welcome, Julia. Thank you, Anita. Um, it's just really wonderful to be here today with all of you and um, to have an opportunity to share a glimpse of what's in the online course Anita mentioned that I co-created with former Dean Pamela Matson of the School of Earth, uh, Energy and Environmental Sciences. And she and I are the primary co-instructors in that course, but we've got some great um, industry experts who share their personal experience. And so circular economy is one of the many strategies and approaches we cover in that course, and I'm excited to kind of delve into it a little bit more deeply with you today. So in terms of um, the outline of what I'd like to share this morning is first a concept and conversation around sustainability in business. Uh, it's really important to set the stage in terms of what are we talking about when we say sustainability and how does an interdependent and complex view of the world allow us to understand the real promise of circularity. So I'll do that first uh, context setting then talk about the advantage of pursuing circular economy and delve into five business models that are particularly promising um, in terms of applying and integrating circular economy strategy into your business. And then finally, if we have time, I'll tell a bit of a story about what HP Inc. has been doing um, as a model that you can consider as you think about integrating circularity. So first of all, um, let's talk about sustainability. Um, often, I think, we hear sustainability and we think of it as sort of a green term or an environmental concept. And really sustainability is about people. It is about the well-being of all of us uh, and not just a privileged few and well-being over time. How do we secure the well-being of all people across generations, not just in this current generation? So that is fundamentally about finding an economic pathway, a social pathway that is, provides for development that meets the needs of the present, as you see here on the slide, 
without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this came from the World Commission on Environment and Development back in 1987 when we first defined what sustainable development means as a global community. So another way I want to think about sustainability today is in a very interdependent way. I think we, you know, in, in business, we often hear about the three pillars, economy, society, environment. We see them as sort of these three separate pillars that we need to think about, or occasionally we'll see them as a, an overlapping Venn diagram of three circles, economy, society, and environment. This interdependent view of sustainability is much more accurate in terms of how the world actually works. Our economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment and not the other way around, as urban ecologist and philosopher Jane Jacobs points out. We do not have an economy without a thriving environment. So to see um, our economic and social um, cultural strategies as embedded in the environment is absolutely fundamental in terms of understanding how can we advance um, well-being in the world. And that's where circularity comes from. We, we have to base our understanding of what we need to do in business on the reality of how the world works. And the world works in terms of complex interdependent systems where the economy, society, and environment are all highly interconnected and interdependent on one another. So let me just go into a little bit of a conversation around complicated versus complex. Because as I just said, we are living in a complex dynamic world with feedbacks and trade-offs between what we do and how that affects the natural environment and how the natural environment affects us. And so understanding as business leaders, the difference between complicated contexts and complex is highly important because we are living in a complex world. Our operating environment in business is complex. So let's look at differentiating the two so we can really understand complex and then make decisions about how do we work effectively in a complex world. So first off, complicated, okay? What characterizes a complicated context? First of all, it can, it's a context that contains intricately contain, um, combined or involved parts. Um, one would say the opposite of complicated is simple. Uh, you've got a definable problem in a complicated context. Usually existing know-how is adequate. And you know sometimes it requires expert knowledge, but still it's existing knowledge. And that you're in a relatively stable context and the outcome is predictable. When you shift to thinking about complex challenges or the nature of our complex operating environment, you see that we have parts that are so interconnected as to make the whole perplexing. And when you think about some of the social environmental interactions I just mentioned, right, between society and the environment. Um, the opposite of complex, this is really important, is independent. Because by definition, complexity is about relationships. It's about all of these complex relationships, these interdependencies that exist in our world. We've seen it, of course, with COVID really coming home, you know, how interdependent we are. So the opposite of complex is independent. Um, in complex contexts, many parts of a problem are not definable. There is therefore a need for constant adaptation, improvisation, experimentation, learning to keep figuring out ways that work in this complex dynamic world. And in complex contexts, we're um, usually in an unstable situation, unstable context where the outcomes are not entirely predictable. And so that, you know, just getting our heads around complexity and interdependence is central to understanding then business strategies that will actually work over the long term and allow us to secure intergenerational well-being, which is how I defined sustainability a minute ago. Um, a simple way to think about it maybe is a Ferrari in a rainforest. A Ferrari falls in the realm of complicated. You know, you could take it all apart, very complicated, but all those parts with an expert mechanic and the right blueprint, you could put right back together. The whole is the sum of the parts. Take a tropical rainforest, much more dynamic, complex, with all sorts of relationships between the various animals and the you know, systems of that forest. You do something different, like reroute a water source or let a species go extinct. You don't actually know how that's going to affect the system and how to bring it back to good function. So one way to think about this in kind of business terms is VUCA world. Maybe many of you have heard this concept. It actually came from the US Army War College after the end of the Cold War to describe the kind of new geopolitical context that we were facing, where things weren't so simple anymore. It wasn't just the US and Russia anymore, or US and USSR anymore. It was a much more complex geopolitical environment. And now, since the sort of early 2000s, business has been using that as a way to describe the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous operating environment we need to figure out how to work in. So what is business doing about this recognition that we are living in a complex world where there are all sorts of non-linearities and feedbacks and time delays in terms of us taking action and seeing how that plays out in the natural world and 
um, getting feedbacks. Well, first of all, business is taking a much more systems perspective. Um, this reality, this complex reality requires business to recognize that it is part of a much larger dynamic system, both affecting that system and being affected by it. And so Paul Pullman, the former CEO of Unilever, talks about how business needs to take more of a systems approach to their operations, seeing companies as part of an interconnected web linking multiple players. And you know, taking this systems perspective, once we shift our minds to doing that, a couple of things naturally follow. First, um, it becomes very clear that we have greater responsibility than we thought, because all of a sudden we broaden our view and we see, gosh, you know, you look out to the supply chain, to all the people we're engaged with in our business, we have responsibility beyond our core company. And that leads us to see these individuals and partners and say, okay, how do we engage more fully the various stakeholders, this much broader perspective on stakeholders who are involved in our work? Second, it calls us to integrate sustainability. How can we actually work in this complex system and thrive ourselves as well as deliver good outcomes in the world without integrating sustainability? This is essential for risk mitigation so we can you know, really continue. It's also critical for resilience, building resilience, and even more so for value creation. We can't create long-term value without integrating sustainability into core strategy. So with that kind of foundation of thinking about interdependence, complexity, and sustainability, let's look at why the circular economy aligns with this more systemic view of reality and the business operating environment. Um, one premise is that if we can think about, gosh, if we have a system and we can capture, use, pass around energy as much as possible before it leaves the system, we have a lot more to work with. If we kind of pull energy in and let it disperse quickly, we have a lot less to work with. And if you look at kind of how we've been doing business for a very long time, it is it's much more the latter. We've had a very linear economy where we are sort of on a take, make, waste approach to producing goods. We take natural resources from the earth, we make goods and, serve, goods and products, and we dispose of them often before the end of their natural life cycle. This linear um, system has significant limits on a, on a finite planet, of course. And so how do we kind of think about shifting from the take, make, waste model to one of circularity? And that's what this talk is really delving into. And it leans on what we already know from natural systems. I mean, natural systems have had 3.8 billion years to evolve in a way that makes sense in this complex interdependent world that we're living in. If you look at the Amazon rainforest food web, you see that every species involved is connected and also providing a service and allowing there to be actually no waste in that system. All waste in natural systems is actually broken down and captured, um, reused as nutrients for other organisms. So if you think about say animal waste from monkeys and tapirs in this forest or leaf litter that falls to the ground, it's broken down by the bacteria and fungi you see there in the bottom of the picture. And those transform these wastes into nutrients that create healthy soils and support the growth of trees and animals. So what can we learn from this system and what can we reflect on in terms of how we've done things in the past? This is just a bit of a glimpse of how we've done things in the past. This is showing that we have followed this kind of linear model to use resources in order to generate economic development. Um, that worked with a relatively small global population, but now we have to ask ourselves a new question. How can we help more people experience well-being not just get out of poverty, but actually thrive in a resource constrained world. So there are 2.5 billion people who will join the middle class by 2030. That's you know less than 10 years from now. And we can't do it following this model shown in this graph with this linear high resource consumption to drive economic development. Projections are that we would actually need three planet Earths to do that. Okay, so we, we've got an indication there that we can't continue in this path. Another indication is just sort of an economic read. Um, this is a study by Accenture, a global consulting firm, that basically shows that markets are finally reflecting the reality of our resource-constrained world. Before 2000, you can see there on the graph, um, the commodity price index fell with GDP growth. We seem to have figured out, we thought, you know, a way to keep growing with cheaper and cheaper commodities. 
What we don't see in that graph is that this was, of course, because we were not paying the true cost of our economic development and growth. The cost of our wasteful practices were externalized, so through big subsidies um, that didn't show the true cost. But nonetheless, even with this externalization of cost, by 2000, there was a fundamental shift in which commodity prices started going up by 1.5% on average for every percentage of growth in GDP. Um, and again, this was without factoring in externalities. So fundamentally, now if we kind of delve into circular economy, circular economy is about finding ways to decouple this economic development that we need um, from the use of scarce resources. And it requires disruptive technology, disruptive business models based on very different principles from our linear system. And that's why I, I talked at the beginning about moving to a mindset of understanding complexity and interdependence, because once we really make that shift and see the world through much more of a relationship lens, we can understand why we need to make these fundamental disruptive shifts in technology and business. So we need them to focus on longevity. You can see in this list, renewability, reuse, repair, upgrade. Think about the Amazon forest as you think about these words and how it functions, right? Refurbishment, capacity sharing, um, and dematerialization. So those are some of the fundamental principles of circular economy. And then, you know, holding those principles is a culture, is a mindset, is a set of norms. And so far we've had sort of a mindset that we can continue to use resources and throw them away. And what we're starting to recognize is kind of, there is no away, right? We are living on one planet Earth. Wherever we throw things, that away is here. And so we're bumping up against that reality. Europe and China are much further ahead than the United States in circular economy approaches in part because they've bumped up against that reality faster because they have less land compared to the number of people. But um, the cultural paradigm shift we need to make in terms of mindset is as we think about interdependence and relationships and complexity, we start seeing that, gosh, maybe we can move from ownership and consumption mindsets to just accessibility. If we can access the things we need, do we actually need to own them or consume them directly from products and production to services and sharing? As long as we get the service, the service of lighting, do we actually need to produce um, and own the product of light? Um, designing for obsolescence has been our way so that companies can make more by selling more. Designing for longer life. How do we create business models that generate revenue and profit by designing for longer life? Moving from waste, a vision of there's just waste, we gotta get rid of it, to gosh, waste is actually resources not yet put to use. How can we see waste differently? And finally, from less bad to more good. I think you know a lot of our orientation has been in the business world to, gosh, okay, we've got to get on the sustainability um, train. Maybe we can just minimize our you know, environmental footprint, reduce waste, reduce energy use. All of that's very important. And we need to say, how are we as critical players in the economy to generate this goal, to advance this goal of intergenerational well-being? So not just to do less harm, but to actually be critical players in moving us towards a sustainable society. So let's look for a minute at waste because waste is so central um, and sort of the, a keystone piece of understanding circularity. This is um, from studies done by Accenture, um, looking at sort of taking a four dimensional view on waste in order to see the real potential of the circular economy. It comes from the book, uh, Waste to Wealth that was published a few years ago and explains that you know, by 2030, the linear growth model's inability to deal with growing demand for resources will result in a gap of 8 billion tons between supply of and demand for constrained natural resources. So this figure nearly equals the total resource use in 2014. So if you think about all the resources we used back in 2014 in this entire country, the gap between the demand and supply of 8 billion tons for natural resources in just eight years, um, that's the estimate. So um, the most likely scenario that they modeled in the study translates to $4.5 trillion of lost growth in just eight years, ballooning to almost six times that, or to, to, yeah, just under six times that to 25 trillion in just 20 more years after that. So um, we've got to understand waste and see what we can do about it as we move towards circularity. So first, um, if you look at the top right quadrant there, we have wasted resources in our sourcing, or sorry, the top left court quadrant, wasted resources in our sourcing and manufacturing that could be tackled by introducing better practices, renewable energy, bio-based and green chemicals, 
um, and naturally based materials. So um, if you think about, for instance, um, farming, only 40% of irrigation water actually reaches the plants it was intended for. So we're, we're very wasteful in terms of our sourcing and also manufacturing. Second, in the right quadrant top, we have wasted capacity. So many products are not fully utilized. Think about the automobile. Cars are parked 92% of the time. And offices are used only 35 to 40% of the time. That's probably less now with COVID. Um, and that's only during working hours. So 35 to 40% of the time during working hours. Bottom right quadrant, um, third, we have wasted life cycles. We end up landfilling, back to that linear model. We landfill products when we could maintain, repair, or remanufacture them. And fourth, uh, in that bottom left quadrant, we have wasted embedded values. If we harvested components from products and increased recycling and energy recovery, we could capture the resources in many products that are often lost. So understanding waste um, goes back to that Amazon rainforest analogy of redefining waste as resources not yet put to use. How do we see waste very differently, see opportunities? Okay, so let's just take a step back and look at the global scope um, of the circular economy. Accenture in the, the Waste to Wealth book I mentioned estimates it to be worth 4.5 trillion by 2030, um, creating an unassailable com competitive advantage for firms. The European Commission in 2016 um, said that circular activities generated almost 147 billion euros in value added. ING, um, the Dutch multinational banking and financial services firm says the US focus on sustainability is dramatically intensifying, that twice as many firms between, between the years of 2018 and 2019, so just in one year, are embedding sustainability into strategic decision-making, and circularity is a big part of that. So how does circularity kind of increase competitiveness? Three main factors have been highlighted by the analyses that have been done of businesses pursuing circularity. First, um, in the area of growth and, and customers, Capturing a multi-billion dollar opportunity from financing the circular economy is possible. If you consider Airbnb, they created a $35 billion business without using any energy, metal, or other resources to build a single house. Increasing competitiveness and profitability uh, through profitability. Um, some companies are increasing gross profit by 50% while reducing material use by 90%, all by recovering and remanufacturing used components. And then sustainability and trust. Companies are closing the loop on materials and products to create supply chain security and enhance consumer relations. Because if you're um, closing the loop and, and say leasing instead of selling, you stay in touch with your consumers. You get more information from them. You also control that product so you can recycle and reuse a lot of the original products. So you have much more supply chain security. And we'll look in a moment at how Michelin has done that by and turning some of its tire company into a business that leases rather than sells tires. Okay, so let's now that we've kind of understood the global context is interdependent, complex, dynamic, recognize that a linear model doesn't work in, in the, a world of interdependence um, because it fundamentally discounts the reality of total connection and, and, and systems thinking. And so circularity is an approach a holistic integrated approach that makes much more sense in a world of interdependence. Let's look now more deeply at five business models that companies are using that have yielded the greatest impact um, from a circular economy perspective. So um, when Accenture did its study of over 120 companies, these five circular business models kind of emerged as the most significant. They include uh, circular supply chain, recovery and recycling, product life extension, sharing platform, and product as service. So let's just look at an example or two of each one. So in terms of circular supply chain, when a company needs resources that are scarce or environmentally destructive, it can either pay more or find alternatives. And the circular economy, um, circular supply chain business model introduces fully renewable, recyclable, or biodegradable materials um, as the core for the manufacturing process. Um, and of course, then by nature, these can be used in consecutive life cycles to continue to reduce costs, increase predictability and control, and of course, have no environmental negative impact. 
Ecovative Design is just a fascinating company. I actually had a really special connection to this company, gosh, 20 years ago when I was executive director of the Lemelson Foundation. We gave one of our many university grants, um, $10,000 to these two guys at Rensselaer Polytechnic when they came up with this idea of using mycelium, which is a natural fungi. It's the kind of the threads that um, pull, that mushrooms can grow from. Um, and they found a way to grow this and create products from it that would replace styrofoam, other plastics, leather, um, allowing us to provide alternatives to those foam packaging peanuts, the styrofoam packaging peanuts, other sy synthetic insulation products that are really um, toxic, and even furniture and other construction materials that um, can be much more sustainable and biodegradable. So um, they have grown so much since then. They're now a multi-million dollar company with many series of rounds of investment and have scaled up to a very diverse product line. Um, the company anticipates the price to fall um, quite soon to 10 to 30% below traditional alternatives. So they're actually able to come in now with this investment in their growth to a lower cost. And um, in terms of you know competing for scarce land, obviously as we're trying to feed 10 billion people by 2050, we've got to think about land use. This fungi, these mycelium can be built in a lab. So they aren't competing for land availability with food producers. A second business model to consider is recovery and recycling. So in the recovery and recycling business model, everything previously considered waste is revived for other uses, effectively eliminating not only waste, but the concept of waste. You know, it's just a material that we need to figure out how we can use. So companies either recover end of life products to recapture and reuse valuable material, energy and components, or they reclaim waste and byproducts from a production process. So this business model requires a two-way supply chain. So you're moving products to consumers and customers and bringing end of life goods back. Um, different industries can share byproduct resources. So you can have clustering where one company, like this example of Novellus and Ford, I'll talk about in a second, one company can direct sell to other industries that need or want your unneeded or unwanted outputs of your production process. So for example, Ford created an innovative supply chain that allows Ford to reuse most of the 40% of the aluminum scrap that is produced in the production of its aluminum F-150s. Um, Ford made an investment, installed 60 million worth of pneumatic scrap handling equipment, separates aluminum alloy scraps after a vehicle is manufactured, and then the shredded scrap, scrap is shipped to a Novellus plant, where Novellus then processes it back into aluminum sheets and coils, and Ford purchases it from Novellus to then use on new vehicles. Interface is another fascinating example. This is a huge carpet manufacturer, a real leader, um, real leader in advancing sustainability from a corporate strategy perspective. They use nylon, first of all, from discarded fishing nets that are a huge issue in the ocean. I, you may have heard from my bio, I used to work in marine conservation for World Wildlife Fund, and discarded fishing gear is a huge problem in the ocean, killing a lot of marine life, but also um, leading to pl plastic um, increased plastic in the ocean. So they use nylon from discarded fishing nets to make carpet and they combine that material with recycled PVB from building glass and car windscreens. PVB is like an adhesive that helps the glass stay together but be flexible and have optical clarity. So um, all those windscreens used to just completely go to the landfill. They now use PVB from these windscreens to use to replace latex, a rel relatively toxic substance, in carpet tiles. And through this, they've managed to reduce their carbon footprint by 80%. If um, you think about it, there are 1 billion cars in the world annually on average, five to 6% have a replacement window. It's a lot. And PVB had not ever had a second life until Interface found this opportunity. Okay, the third model to talk about product life extension through remanufacturing. I mentioned Michelin. So they have transitioned from a product to a service oriented business model. You remember when I talked about some of those cultural shifts earlier, this idea of moving, how do we move from sort of product thinking to service thinking, from ownership to accessibility? So by leasing rather than selling tires, the company stays engaged with its customers, gathering feedback from them to inform product innovation. So when they get a tire back, they can look at the tire, see how it's worn, talk to the customer, see what worked or didn't work about the tire, and that allows them to spur innovation, that immediate feedback by staying connected to consumers and being able to look at the actual product after it's been used. Um, also, by controlling its product, good tires can be recovered 
and released. So if they're still good when they come back from the first lease, they can get leased again. At the end, if they are kind of end of life cycle tires, Michelin all of a sudden now controls the, the core content of its product, the rubber in those tires, and they can be recycled into playground surfaces or converted into fuel. So the company has moved on this quite quickly in, in, e, in the EU in particular, but also Brazil and has 97% recycling rates in those two locations. Caterpillar um, has done something quite similar, um, but for their <laughs> product, they have a global network of remanufacturing facilities and they take back millions of end of life units for remanufacturing. So the company remanufactures hundreds of millions of pounds of material each year um, this remanufacturing process is much less energy intensive than producing new materials, 85 to 95% less than new production. And so it both reduces waste and also the need for virgin resources. Okay, so finally, um, sharing platform is our fifth business model to consider. In developed economies, industrialized economies, up to 80% of things stored in the home are used only once a month. So again, this huge idling capacity, when we looked at that four dimensional view of waste, you can see you know, a lot of inefficiencies in terms of our use of all these products that we have. The sharing platform business model provides a platform to connect product owners with individuals or organizations that would like to use them, boosting the productivity of products that may sit idle by allowing co-access or co-ownership. So the sharing economy is not new, as you probably know. I mean, think of libraries um, that we've had for so long and bartering in traditional societies um, or just simple you know, neighborhood sharing of tool sheds that we've had in, in many places around the world, farming communities. Um, but at the scale it's operating, it's emerged from a context of recognizing our limited resources, of having the density of urbanization where you've got large groups of people together who need common things, um, and then digital platforms are breakthroughs in terms of the internet and the dig digital platforms that exist that enable matchmaking between people with things to share and those who want to use them. And then our natural drive to connect, you know, the kind of malaise of urban life where we'd actually like to be more connected like we used to be in more traditional communities. Um, a lot of the proponents of the sharing economy highlight actually the new relationships that develop with neighbors and other people in community as a result of the sharing connections are one of the most valuable outcomes of sharing economy. So um, when we look back also at those culture trends, this ties very much into access over ownership, that idea of making that shift from, from ownership to, to access. Um, the sharing economy, is, as many of you are aware, ev has evolved over you know, many years um, at scale, at the scale we're seeing it now. So starting first with kind of the Craigslist of the world, classified advertisements to the rentals of homes through Airbnb to then TaskRabbit, a marketplace for small jobs, and then, of course, to passengers um, connecting with drivers, such as through Lyft and Uber, and then a marketplace like Udemy um, for teaching and learning, and so many more um, than that. What we're starting to see is that sharing platform model, which is unlike the other models that was very much consumer to consumer or peer to peer, individual to individual rather than business to business, um, that still is the dominant feature of the sharing economy and what's really important as a complement to these other models, which are much more business to business. And as the customer to customer or peer to peer sharing platforms mature, the model is actually becoming more visible in business to business as well. So we're starting to see it kind of enter at that scale as well, especially for expensive assets with low utilization rates. So Storefront is one sharing economy company that is using um, short term retail space rentals for pop-up retail locations. So that's one manifestation at the B2B level. And then Flow2, started in Scandinavia, enables sharing of massive construction technology, such as earth diggers, tractors, excavators, um, allowing companies and institutions to access not just the technology, but the services and skills of personnel as well. So all of this is very much an evolution and businesses you know, are driving the innovation of these models as they experiment and make change so let's sum up just briefly the key points on um, circular economy, and then we'll go briefly into a story about Hewlett Packard. So first of all, circular economy, like the Amazon rainforest, it closes the loop in production using renewable resources and integrating outputs and byproducts into production. It creates a closed loop environment 
where all waste is are just resources not yet put to use. And it's a way of figuring out how to, first of all, not generate toxic waste by changing the materials through the circular um, supply chain model. And then once we've got materials out in circulation, how do we keep them in circulation for as long as possible? Like that first quote I mentioned, uh, when we shifted to talking about circular economy, how do we take energy into the system? You look at the rainforest, right? Taking sun and water and all of that energy into the system and keeping it in circulation for as long as possible. How do we design our economy so that we can do that? Second, um, as I mentioned, it's, it's about values and culture. It's a new value system based on an understanding of complexity and interdependence that emphasizes access, long-term thinking, sharing, and decoupling, the critical decoupling of development, our, creating our well-being and the well-being of the nearly 10 billion people we're expecting by 2050, decoupling that from the use of scarce resources, because we know we can't follow that traditional linear model I showed um, and actually achieve this goal of intergenerational well-being. Um, I talked about the enormous financial potential uh, based on the studies of Accenture, ING, um, studies from the EU, and the manifestation that engagement in circular economy is growing globally. We talked a little bit about the competitive advantage it offers for business in the areas of growth, customer relations, and profitability, and described those five circular business models. So let's um, talk briefly about a story of HP Inc. This is maybe something you can consider as you think about, gosh, how might we actually take a step if we haven't already in circular economy, or if we've taken a few steps, what might be the next steps we could take? Um, HP Inc. began with their company vision. Their vision is to re reinvent everything we do every day, their product, relationship with customers, how they bring products to marketplace. So they're really kind of looking at this way of like, how can we keep improving ourselves and society through reinvention, questioning how we do things, being open to doing things differently. This adapt orientation is so essential. You know, once you connect with the reality of an interdependent world and see that, you then need to say, okay, gosh, how do we need to adapt this way of thinking that we've had before, these linear ways of operating, these ways of sort of generating waste over here so we can have profitability over there don't make sense when you take a systems perspective on the world and you see everything is interconnected. And so, you know, Dave Packard early on said, the betterment of our society is not a job to be left to a few. It is a responsibility to be shared by all. So um, from this kind of core part of their vision, and I think for each you know, of us in our organizations and companies, we've got to go back to that core purpose and vision and say, okay, that's where we start, and then what makes sense to take from there in terms of circularity, sustainability strategy. Um, and so their sustainable impact strategy kind of was formulated around this concept of planet, people, and community, not unlike that nested three circles I shared at the beginning with economy, society, and environment. Um, they identified um, a major problem that they are part of, plastic waste. Um, just incredible to look at this 1955 Life Magazine article that was promoting this throwaway culture, you know, back to culture and how powerful culture is. We really promoted this, how wonderful plastics were because they allowed Mary Jane here and her family to have a dinner party and she would only have sort of 30 minutes of cleanup to do instead of hours and hours because everything could be thrown away. It was called throwaway living. And so, you know, now HP looks at it and says, gosh, we've promoted the wide use of plastics in the 50s and we now have 11 million metric tons of plastic entering the ocean each year. And if you take a systems perspective, we are part of that reality. Um, and so how do we look at this and say, not just how do we do less bad, but how can we actually be contributing to more good? Um, so they first evaluated areas of their business with the greatest carbon footprint and confirmed that they could make a significant material impact by integrating plastic recycling in their supply chain. So the supply chain piece of their business had a little less than the products and solution in terms of carbon footprint, but it was one they could get their hands around more because it was the materials they were using for manufacturing their products. Their products and solutions, that part of the supply chain was really looking at the carbon footprint generated by consumers, customers like you and me using their products, using their printers and the energy we were consuming using that, which is a little bit more difficult for them to impact. So they said, okay, let's dig in to a hugely material part of our work, um, part of our um, company business, the supply chain and say, what can we actually do to minimize waste and maybe even help clean up some of the world's oceans? So they first said, gosh, 
do we have any experience in our company in doing any of this? Have we innovated in this area at all? And can we learn from it and also use that to inform the feasibility of this idea and, and what the goal should be? Well, sure enough, um, they had for many years uh, innovated in the area of plastics recycling. Quite recently, they had created the Tango printer shown there on the left, which is made from 30% recycled plastic, um, including old printers. So they knew that was possible. They'd also been using um, recycled plastics and making print cartridges for quite a number of years. So with that perspective, they set an ambitious goal to use 30% of post-consumer recycled content across its um, a recycled plastic content across their personal systems and print portfolio. They're currently at 7%. Their vision is 100% long-term and their goal, um, mid-range goal is to reach 30%. So they then said, okay, gosh, we've you know, done this for, for a while with our print cartridges. We, um, after customers buy ink and use it, they return their empty cartridges to HP. We sort and shred the materials. We add bottles and hangers to that. And then we um, make original cartridges with that recycled plastic. And they said, gosh, how do we get those million bottles of plastic per day? Um, maybe we can think about a new way of, of sourcing those. And they looked at Haiti um, and saw a huge opportunity in Haiti. This is a canal in Haiti. When it rains, this canal floods and takes plastics out to the ocean. Lots of it washes up back to shore. And um, the more HP learned about, I actually have to pause. I'm, I'm feeling really, really ill for a second here. I'm sorry, I, I need to pause. That, that's okay, Julia. Um, go ahead and um, take a moment there. Um, if you wanna adjust, if you have a chair close by. Whoop, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, no problem. And um, go ahead and take a break. And I want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we do have a number of questions um, that were submitted and um, for things to think about. Um, I, I'd like to take you through perhaps uh, the next slide and um, show how the impact um, uh, HP has made um, with bringing in community and finding opportunity. Um, and so you can see uh, folks here working to uh, with HP um, to take the bottled products and plastics out of the environment, creating a job opportunity and uh, in places where perhaps there wasn't one and we, I think we've all seen the pictures of uh, all the plastic um, in, in our oceans. And I know at least for me, it, it does make me sad on certain days. Um, and I'm glad to know that there are people that are addressing the issue. Um, you can see that uh, utilizing over 25 million bottles of ocean bound plastic, um, which is phenomenal. And then bringing in the local community and the uh, young um, to learn about what's going on and providing them with the technology to um, learn about uh, what, what they can do and how they can be a part of this process. Um, not only to improve business, their life community, um, but also to save the earth. And you can see here some folks that participated in the program. And um, uh, and I, I know Julia would have more to talk about for this one. Um, and um, But it's great showing how people came together um, working with HP uh, to pull this off. There you are. Oh, can't, can't hear you. So you might have to switch to your computer audio. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Sarah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh, I've been struggling a bit with some health issues, and I just felt like I was like getting super hot and might like, I don't know. So I'm so no, sorry, no, but no Anita, problem, thanks no for. Problem. I'm just gonna sit, I think, for the rest. But I really appreciate you finishing up. I mean, I'll just say. This opportunity in Haiti was one where they took a very holistic systems perspective on the challenge. So that you know, this whole idea of the people, planet, and um, community that they had set as their original strategy based on their core vision was really manifest in what they were able to do in Haiti. Um, so, like from a materials perspective, from a planet perspective, they said, "Gosh, you know, we can actually address some of the ocean plastic pollution issue by using recycled instead of virgin materials, and by using plastic bound for the oceans rather than from an already established kind of global plastics market." So they could actually be part of the, the oceans-related issue. And then from a people perspective in Haiti. There's an 80 percent unemployment rate, um, so there's a need to like solve for jobs, living wages. Um, huge opportunity there to say, okay, gosh, how can we actually ensure that waste pickers and people who are involved in this plastics recycling supply chain can earn a fair wage um, and and get out of basically unemployment or living on a far below kind of living wage? And then from a community standpoint. They engaged, you know, as Anita pointed out in that last slide, which I'll get to, um, they supported education. Uh, they worked with a local NGO to improve health and education, particularly for the children of, of, of workers. So, you know, if you look at here, they basically found a local partner. And this is back to the kind of relationship lens and looking out and feeling greater responsibility in your supply chain. They looked outward and said, okay, how... Um, how might we engage a local partner in this? And they found this recycler, but it needed that, that group needed a lot of capacity building actually to meet HP standards. So they invested in the capacity building of this local recycler. So they worked with them on cleanliness standards so the materials could actually be clean enough to be used by HP. Um, so they had to teach them about eliminating contamination and how to remove labels and caps, just basic capacity building. And then they worked with the recycler on supply chain code of conduct. So they improved the standard, um, the social standards in this company, improving the treatment of workers, um, their ergonomics, standing there at that sorting machine on comfortable blocks instead of cement floor, um, creating better working conditions, better safety standards, um, and then require them to offer a living wage, um, several times higher than the Haitian minimum wage. Um, they also then invested in helping this recycler with their business operations. So they helped remove cost and inefficiency from their process. They were compressing and then shredding the bottles, but compressing wasn't necessary. So they helped them kind of innovate to improve um, profitability as well. So um, those pictures that you that Anita shared, you know, here's you know the the ocean plastics bound, now used in printers. Also, these are the the children of waste pickers who are now in school accessing technology using a printer made from ocean bound plastics in Haiti. And again, just this emphasis of as Anita mentioned, the the whole supply chain and really thinking about. How does everyone fit together? You've got HP Inc. kind of central headquarters represented by Ellen Joukowsky on the left, driving this whole process, thinking holistically about it, tying to it to HP Inc.'s vision. And then you've got Richardson from Haiti, the, the country manager for First Mile, which is, you know, he's kind of over there towards the right. Um, and he is the one involved with kind of being HP's country manager, working on environment, health, and safety for the collectors. And then work, the organization called Work, is providing the educational and medical access, pictured there on the far right. Um, and then Ed, the CEO of the recycling company, how he was able to evolve things um, to really provide better work, greater business efficiency for himself and, and profitability, but living wages for the people working for him. So, um, and then just the continued innovation. So HP, this slide talks about this $2 million washing line investment. So they leverage funds to invest in this washing line. Um, it's up and running this year, or I guess maybe prior, a couple of years ago. And the idea was to significantly increase quality and production quantity um, in Haiti, adding another thousand income opportunities for people, so jobs. Um, current, before this washing station, dirty flakes were sent to South Carolina to get washed. Um, that was a pretty inefficient process, you know, to ship all of that out and, and do that part of the process there. So now. They're bringing that capacity into Haiti for a comparable cost, but obviously a carbon reduction in terms of the extra transport and also keeping value in Haiti, allowing them to kind of pursue their people planet um, objectives. So 
I'll stop there and answer questions. And thank you all for, for being patient. I, I'm feeling much better now. So happy to answer some questions. Thank you very much. And we do have a number of questions. Let's uh, see what we can uh, do here. And I'm going to go ahead and take us to the last slide there. Um, let's see here. What up, you know, on people's mind, and I'm not sure how comfortable you are to answer this question. Um, we had a couple of questions come in regarding the situation in Ukraine. And one key one is how could uh, Ukrainians, people around the world, come together to transform, after the war, transform Ukraine um, to follow these approaches and methodologies? Um, do you have ideas, suggestions? Um, uh, how can organizations, nonprofits, for profit um, rebuild um, mm. with sustainability in mind? I threw you, I wow. threw you a hard ball. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, this is the, exactly the nature of, I mean, I love that question because that is exactly the mindset that we actually need to shift to, which is looking at the whole world, this complex system and saying, we've got to bring these kind of approaches, these approaches that recognize interdependence, that recognize complexity, and that are actually durable long-term ways of doing things and see how we can apply them. So I think it's the most perfect question. Um, I mean, gosh, I, a few thoughts. One is, I, I love this quote about systems change, which is that in order to change a system, you need to change the relationships of the actors in the system. So what would it look like to look at Ukraine and say, you know, who are the core stakeholders for rebuilding that country? You know, all of them. And what are their current relationships? How could those relationships be different um, in such a way as to create a sustainable, strong society. So I would say, you know, beyond economy, what are the, the cultural and social aspects that would help? And then the other thing I think with systems change that we sometimes forget about, it is all about relationships, and, but it's not just changing the existing relationships. It is that, and it's often introducing new relationships. So maybe are there actors that aren't yet engaged that need to be, those relationships that need to be formed, or are there um, new kinds of enterprises that need to, to emerge? So. Um, I think, you know, to be concrete in terms of circular economy, I would say, you know, first, we've got to look at policies. Are there policies that um, incentivize waste? Are there policies that incentivize reuse of materials? Um, are, how, what are the taxing systems? Like governments can tax labor or they could tax resource use. You know, maybe we shouldn't be taxing labor. We value human contribution, but we tax resource use. So you know, that's one piece. You could look at the policies and then you could look at, you know, specific, do a sector analysis. You know, what are the biggest sources of the economy, um, the most important parts of the economy in the Ukraine and look at them one by one, just like Accenture did from a material standpoint and say, where's the greatest opportunity for circularity in these core business sectors and learn from other models around the world in similar sectors and what they've done and see how those could be applied in Ukraine. But I started my answer with a broader point because I do think that's the most fundamental is a cultural shift. And, and often in crisis, we're more poised to make cultural shifts. So there may be an opportunity. Gosh, I mean, the, the Ukrainians, I've been on a, a feed as part of my Young Global Leader network with our Ukrainian partners, um, Young Global Leaders. They're giving us just the, these feeds on what's going on in the war and what they're thinking about. And I can say they are so determined and so... Um, committed. It's, it's quite extraordinary. So I think the potential for like being radical and saying, let's just shift the whole economy to circularity and let's do this in one fell swoop. I mean, I think there's a good moment in crisis for that kind of radical change. So, I mean, exciting, exciting opportunity and, and great question. Hope that helps some. But. That's great. Uh, I, I appreciate the, you know, I hadn't really thought about the taxing, you know, labor versus, um, uh, products and and different policies that can really influence um, change. So that 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 was great. Um, yeah. I think we have time for maybe one more question, um, and this is about the balance between capitalism and sustainability and the circular economy. And finding um, there are two questions that were related. So this one with capitalism and and sustainability um, and. Uh, the product life cycle. If we, we create, develop products that have a longer life cycle, 
people purchase less um, and um, uh, we may not be polluting more, um, but uh, then how do companies regain that profitability? It's capitalism. Okay, I'm not sure I fully, can you give me the high, high level on that question? Sure. I'm not sure I fully got, sure. yeah. Um, if uh, uh, corporations, organizations, or corporations, for-profit corporations are uh, developing products that have a longer lifespan, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they don't charge more because uh, the the product is is uh, the same price, um, they won't be selling more product, right? People won't be mm -hmm. buying more. Right now, we have the throwaway economy. I will buy, mm -hmm. you know, five hundred plates. Yeah. Um, okay. I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I think embedded in that question is kind of stick, staying with the mindset of selling products is the path for income. So I think what circularity and, and kind of how we need to think is, is how do we reinvent so that that isn't necessarily the path for income. It's not just selling products, it's selling a service. And how do you value that service and access to that service? How do you innovate in new areas where there is consumer demand and do it in a way that is durable? Um, and I think... You know, I do recommend the book Waste to Wealth. Um, Peter Lacey is one of the main lead authors, L-A-C-Y. And it really goes into what this looks like economically and, and what the shift is. But it does require, you know, it's not about, and, and also I would say you don't have to necessarily assume that you can't sell that product for more. I mean, if there is longevity, you know, pricing, you shouldn't assume that the pricing would stay the same. Um, so that's one piece, but the other piece is to recognize if you're shifting from product to service, it's just a kind of, a, it's a whole different business model where profit coming in is, is generated in, in a very different way. Great. Um, I think we'll do one more quick question. Do you know how long it took HP to make that transition to implement that circular economy approach? Well, it built on a lot. So for 15 years, maybe it's now 18 or so, they've been working on those print cartridges. So all of us can go online and find out the place nearest us where we can recycle our little HP print cartridges. They've been doing that for about 15 to 20 years um, and invested a lot. I remember talking to Ellen Joukowsky, um, the head of sustainability at HP Inc., about how much they invested in like these machines to sort and, you know, deconstruct and clean and... Um, to figure out actually practically how to do that and to build the, the technology to remanufacture. So it did take investment, but they, they learned a great deal through it. And then they've kind of innovated on that. So for example, as I showed in that slide, they used to source a million plastic bottles a day. And that was from a global plastics market where, you know, just you could buy it off the market, these used plastic bottles. Then when they got into the Haiti project, they said, well, actually we can not just source from a, from a market. Other people can take that. We'll take the higher risk more challenging piece, which is getting that plastic off the ground before it goes into the ocean. Um, so we can stop that problem in a really important country and, and use it as an opportunity to also support development. And so the Haiti project has been probably the last, I don't know for sure, we, we, we need to look it up, but I think probably about this last seven to seven years or so. Um, All right. Great. Yeah. Um, with that, we've, we've hit time. Um, I want to thank you again um, for joining us today and, and sharing your experiences and, and your knowledge. Um, it has been a pleasure. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody who joined us today. And uh, it's been a delight. And uh, we wish all of you a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.